everybody, Phil Talon here. This is the first mini lecture on visual art, and I want to start each of these lectures with a big takeaway, explain that a bit, and then offer a few examples. And so this lecture is going to be on Christian theology and religious art in brief. There's a lovely image of Jesus raising Jairus's daughter from the dead to kick off our discussion. Theology of the image is rooted in creation and the incarnation. In the incarnation, God uses creation to make himself visible. Faithful Christian artistry is guided by scripture. It must be understood as a creative exercise, working with given materials of creation to make something more, just as Adam the gardener is charged with the task. And our work is judged on its faithfulness to God's command. Early Christian art begins with veiled references to the biblical story and develops into a full-blown symbolic language in the Byzantine and medieval era. In encountering Christian art, we're likely to be comfortable because the symbolic world of Christian art is known to us. We recognize the reference points, even if certain styles of Christian art are outside our tradition. Use of images varies widely among Christian traditions. Some Protestant traditions disallow the use of religious images, citing the second commandment not to make graven images. Defenders of the image usually point out the prohibition of image making is primarily to do with the worship of images. The same book that prohibits the worship of the image, God actually commands making certain images for the tabernacle. The core theological rationale for Christian image making is rooted in the incarnation, which provides a route by which God can be imaged in Jesus. St. John of Damascus makes this case his treatises, just as the First Council of Nicaea establishes the full divinity of the God-man Jesus, the Second Council of Nicaea allows for religious images not to be worshipped, but for veneration. However, because of the abuses of the image and theological reservations after the Reformation, many Protestant traditions reserve visual art as illustration of the biblical text outside of worship. The use of the image here is an invitation to the primacy of the Bible is judged by its faithfulness. The artist must still make interpretive decisions, however, as the biblical text does not clarify exactly how to render the scene, as in Rembrandt's portraits of the prodigal son. As William Durness points out, visual art is not worshipped, but it can be an act of worship. Human creativity is a gift of God. We're made in the image of a creative God. Just as in preaching, we expound the meaning of God's self-revelation. In art, we reflect on the truth, beauty, and goodness of God's gifts of creation and salvation. It's good and bad art. And the value of art is judged in the degree to which it reflects the reality of God's word, God's world, and God himself. As humans, we're tasked with making more of the world. We're cultivators. In an image-saturated culture, one way to orient ourselves is by battling bad images with good images. As Andy Crouch points out, the best way to change culture is to make more good culture. If you don't like the images we see, we should make more better ones. Here's some examples. Uh, so if you want to paint, for instance, the sacrifice of Isaac, the text doesn't determine how old Isaac is. He's a lad. We don't know exactly what that means. And so you could paint him young, which means he's going to be less of a willing participant, or you could paint him as a man, in which case he becomes almost a type of Christ figure. This is what the artist must do in bringing the text to life through the image. Now, finally, the artist can help us to imagine the biblical scene more richly as in Cole's Garden of Eden, where the beauty and immensity of the gift of creation is clearly visualized. There we have a vast landscape full of every good kind of thing, the kind of place one would never want to leave. It highlights the sin of the betrayal of the first humanist. 